So we're going to look at the periodic table a little bit more. Um, back in 1869, Dmitri Mendeleev noticed that certain groups of elements had similar properties. At that point, there was just a, you know, a bunch of known elements, and there was no periodic table. They just kind of like, oh, well, we've got all these elements. We've got this information. So he found that if you put the elements in order of increasing mass, there were properties that repeated in a periodic pattern. Periodic means repeats in a, a, a repeating pattern, exhibit a repeating pattern. So um, you can look at this, and here we have elements 1 through 20 just listed in order of increasing mass. And a little bit like keys on the piano keyboard, you know, this orange one and this one and that one, every eight elements, the, those elements had some common properties. And the green ones here exhibited common properties, and that, that repeated in a pattern. So he summarized this in the periodic law. When the elements are arranged in order of increasing mass, certain sets of properties recur periodically. So one really long list of element names like that isn't so useful. He put the elements in a table, and the table is organized so that the elements um, with similar properties are in columns. Okay, so lithium, sodium, and potassium are in the same column, they share this similar repeating pattern. And so here's a very simple um, periodic table just showing the first 20 elements. There were some gaps in his table um, because it was like, well, this doesn't fit in this place. It, it belongs over here. And so he left a space and predicted Someday they're going to find a new element that's going to go in that hole that I left. Um, he used the, the uh, properties of the elements around that hole to even predict things like boiling point and, and density. And those elements were discovered later. Um, the example given here is one that he called echa silicon. Echa just means below, so it was the element below silicon. And that was discovered in 1886. Um, a German chemist discovered it, and so he named it germanium after his country. <laughs> so this is just sort of an informative uh, periodic table showing when these different elements were discovered. Um, and it's a little bit out of date because this, this row is actually all filled in now. It's kind of interesting. And this is how, in 1869, Dmitri Mendeleev completed the first periodic table. You guys ever played Tetris? Just a little bit? Okay. I thought that was funny. Um, in the modern periodic table, um, we understand that the ordering principle is not the mass, it's actually the number of protons. Now, most of the time, this um, corresponds but there's a couple of places in the periodic table where the mass is out of order um, because it's the number of protons that's the ordering principle. Um, it's not on the slides, but we can find one up here. Um, where did you go? Um, cobalt and nickel. Cobalt is element 27, but its mass is 58.9 something something. Nickel is element 28, has another proton, but its mass is actually a little less, 58.69. And it's different because of the neutrons. So the ordering principle is actually the number of protons. And that's, that's an illustration of a modification to a law. Mendeleev said order of increasing mass. And then we found these things that didn't work out that way. Well, we didn't have to throw out the whole law. We just modified it in order of increasing number of protons. Um, so here's another just sort of informative sort of periodic table showing some of the major divisions. Um, so here in the yellow, all of these elements are metals. In the purple here, those are sort of between the green nonmetals and the yellow metals. 
Those, those are called metalloids or sometimes called semi-metals. Their properties are between metals and non-metals. And in the upper right corner, we have the non-metals. There is a dark line um, that goes through here, and that's the dividing line between the metals and the non-metals. So just using the periodic table on the wall or the one I'll give you on an exam, you should be able to identify whether a given element is a metal, a non-metal, or a semi-metal. The semi-metals are the kind of tricky ones. Up here, and if you forget which is which, find one of the elements that you're familiar with, like oxygen. Is oxygen a metal? No. no. It must be a non-metal then. Um, can you repeat what the black line was again? It didn't really OK, so the, the black line, called the, the stair-step line here, divides between the non-metals and the metals. And other than aluminum and polonium, but we're almost never going to run into him. Other than aluminum, the elements that are touching, that share a side with the stair-step line, are called semi-metals or metalloids. Is aluminum a metal? Yeah, you've got aluminum pans in your kitchen at home. Aluminum is definitely a metal. So that one you should remember. Anything else that's touching that line, I would expect you to tell me it's a semi-metal. Okay. Over here, all of these guys are metals. So like iron is something you're probably familiar with. That's a metal. So we classify the elements as metals, non-metals, or metalloids. And this slide gives some of their characteristics. Metals are good conductors. They conduct heat and electricity. Um, and another, um, probably the most important property for chemistry is they tend to lose electrons in chemical changes. Nonmetals are sort of the opposite of metals. They, they don't conduct well um, and they gain electrons. So metals losing electrons become cations. Nonmetals, because they gain electrons, they become anions. And the metalloids or semi-metals are just kind of in between. So they're in between good conductors and poor conductors. They're semiconductors. Okay, so semiconductors are really, really useful in electronic devices. Um, you should just be familiar with these words. Malleable and ductile. Malleable means you can pound it into a sheet. Ductile means you could pull it into a wire. You can do that with most metals. You can't do that with semi-metals or non-metals. Another way to divide things in the periodic table is the main groups and the transition. So the main group elements are these columns that sort of stick up on each side. So all of these guys are main group elements. These are main group elements. And this part that looks like it sank down here those are called the transition elements. You can think of this as one bank, and here's a river, and there's the other bank. This is the transition from one side to the other. Transition elements have much less predictable properties. They're, they're kind of squirrely. Oh, forgot something. Also in the periodic table, we have periods. Um, the periods are the rows, so one through seven. Um, and then we have group numbers. There are two different systems of numbering the groups. Um, the IUPAC method is to just number them 1 through 18. But in the United States, we often use this other one, um, where the main group elements have the letter A, the transition elements have the letter B. Um, these numbers, actually, I don't find very useful at all. But the A numbers are very useful. So 1A, 2A, you jump over here because this is the rest of the main group, 3 through 8. And we'll find that those numbers are really useful. Periodic table that I give you for an exam will have both of them. This periodic table up here has both of them, although the useful ones are in Roman numerals. So that might be tricky. Some of those groups, the columns, have names. Elements in the groups have similar properties because that's how the table was set up and some of them have names. So group 8A is the noble gases, and they're, one of their common um, characteristics is that they're very unreactive. 
The alkali metals in group 1A are very reactive, and they're all metals. Group 2A, those are called the alkaline earth metals. They're, they're quite reactive, but not as much as the alkali metals. And then the other named group is the halogens, and that's group 7A. Those are nonmetals, and they're also very reactive. So you should know those names. So we mentioned earlier that main uh, metals tend to lose electrons, forming cations. Nonmetals tend to gain electrons. We can predict how many electrons they're going to lose or gain if they're in the main groups. So main group metals um, tend to lose electrons to form a cation that has the same number of electrons as the nearest noble gas. We'll look at a periodic table in a minute, and hopefully that'll make more sense. Uh, Nonmetals tend to gain electrons, gaining negative charges, so they have a negative charge. Um, they form anions, and they're also going to have the same number of electrons as the nearest noble gas. In a later chapter, we will explain in probably more detail than you care to know why it is the number of electrons that the noble gas has. So in general, the alkali metals, group 1A, tends to, they tend to lose one electron and form plus one ions. So group 1A, one plus. The alkaline earth in group 2A form two plus ions. You see a pattern here? Group 1A is one plus, group 2A is two plus. In the nonmetals, um, group 7A, they form a negative one. Uh, that's because they're going to gain one electron. The nearest noble gas is going to have um, eight. So one way to predict the charges on, on these is to say, well, it's the group number minus eight will give you the periodic table. That didn't make any sense. Group number minus eight gives you the number of electrons. No, that didn't make any sense either. I think my brain melted in Phoenix. That would explain some things. Anyway, the group number minus eight is the charge. It's the charge on the nonmetal. So group 6A, um, six minus eight is negative two. They form negative two ions. I need to rearrange these slides. So here's the summary of that. Um, main group elements, the form of cations, the charge is equal to the group number. Those are the A group numbers. For the ones that form anions, nonmetals form negative ions. Okay, nonmetal negative. So those are the anions. The group number minus eight gives you the charge. And then the transition elements, unpredictable. Here's my periodic table. Okay, so this is showing elements that form ions with predictable charges. So over here in group 1A, these all form plus one ions. Now, is hydrogen an alkali metal? Is hydrogen a metal? No. No. We're gonna find that hydrogen, the smallest element, is like the baby brother in a large family, gets away with all kinds of stuff, breaks all the rules. So he's sitting over here, even though he's not a metal, but he fits this pattern of forming a plus one ion. Group two, these guys form plus two ions. Over here, aluminum is a group three metal. It forms a plus three. Now these guys are non-metals. This one's technically a semi-metal. Um, for these semi-metals, they go with whatever side of the line they're on. So tellurium down here is on the non-metal side, so he's going to be a negative ion like the non-metals. If you've got somebody on the metal side, I would expect you to predict that it'll be a positive ion. The noble gases do not form ions. They are group 8A. They just don't react with anything. They're above the rest of us, like the, the nobles in, in England, right? The nobility, they don't interact with the common people, right? So they just stick to themselves. So they're all fine by themselves. This group 7A, 
you take 7 minus 8, you get negative 1. So th that works for some people. Um, what seems to work better for most students is you can look at this like a board game, and if you're starting over here, this would be 0, and you want to know the charge on nitrogen, you're going to count backwards, and counting backwards is negative, right? So if you start over here, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. So what would this one down here be? Negative 3. So 0, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. I'm not sure why they left that one off, because phosphorus does form a predictable ion with a negative 3 charge. What about this one? It doesn't form ions. It doesn't form ions. Now, if you had to predict, what would you predict? Negative 4. It's a nonmetal, so following the pattern, it would be negative and 0 minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 minus 4, but it doesn't actually do that. You don't need to know that, though, because I'll only ask you about the ones that do form ions. Any questions? So there's patterns. It's one of the things I like about chemistry. You learn a pattern, and then you've got all this information instead of just rotely memorizing everything. So we should be able to answer questions like this. Predict the charges of the monatomic ions formed by these main group elements. So nitrogen, N. You find it on the periodic table. It's right in here. Is it going to be positive or negative? Negative, negative because it's a nonmetal. And so we'll predict the charge by starting over here, 0, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. The reason that works is that nitrogen which has seven protons and seven electrons, is going to gain electrons so that it has the same number of electrons as the nearest noble gas. Neon is the nearest noble gas. It's got 10 electrons. So to get from seven to 10, you have to gain three. It'll give you a negative three charge. But counting backwards is easier to remember. So the charge for nitrogen would be three minus. And if we're going to write a symbol for that, we write the element symbol, we write the charge as a superscript, and the sign always goes after the number. Because we don't want this to look like an exponent. We don't want it to look like a variable n raised to the negative 3 power. How about Rb? What charge is that going to have? It's down here. It's a metal, so it's going to form a positive, and it's in group 1. So it'll be plus 1. So that has a 1 plus charge. Writing this symbol, you would write RB and just the positive sign. We'll, we'll observe that chemists often don't write the number 1. You just leave it off. In these charges, you have to write the sign. You don't necessarily have to write the number. So it's a little different than exponents intentionally. Any questions? Yes. So carbon and silicon are um, these would have charge of minus four, right? If if you were asked to predict the charge, I would expect you to predict that carbon and silicon will be negative four. And germanium ten and Pb, um, they have a charge of negative four, or can you do it like a positive That's an excellent question. What about these? They're in the same group. Those are metals, and so they're going to have positive charges. Um, and those are actually not predictable from the periodic table. Any other questions?